Hi, my name is Tom Williamson. I am the branch manager of the Milton Library, and this is Drop Everything and Read. Today I'll be reading from Hunting a Detroit Tiger by Troy Seuss. This is book four in a series of eight books. Uh, the main character is a gentleman named Mickey Rawlings, who is a journeyman Major League Baseball player uh, who happens to be on the Detroit Tigers this year. Uh, so let's start. We're going to read chapter one today to get us started. Chapter one. War hero kills Bolshevik. A four-word headline in the morning edition of the Detroit Journal. Four words, stark and black, and three of them wrong. It was true that I had seen combat in the Great War, but I had done nothing heroic. The heroes were the doughboys who had been mowed down on the desolate ground of no man's land, or felled among splintered trees of the Argonne Forest, and the ones who returned home but had sacrificed parts of themselves over there. Limbs severed by mortar shells, vision seared by mustard gas, minds jellied by relentless pounding of artillery fire. I had come back alive and intact, and suffering no greater disability than the same one that had always afflicted me, a tendency to be suckered by sharp breaking curveballs, low and away. The journal was also wrong about Emmett Seaver. He was a baseball man, not a Bolshevik. As a journeyman outfitter, he played for nine teams in five major leagues from the 1884 St. Louis Maroons to the old Union Association of the 1901 Detroit Tigers Club of the fledgling American League. So why the Bolshevik tag? Because his most recent baseball activities weren't on the playing field, but in the lecture halls. Seaver had been trying to unionize ball players, an endeavor which struck me as having less prospect of success than establishing a fan club for umpires. The most outrageous mistake of the headline though the one that provoked my immediate concern was the way that it connected Ebert Seaver, Emmett Seaver, and me, because I wasn't the one who killed him. What do you mean you didn't kill him, said the death sergeant. I repeated my statement, which I thought sufficiently unambiguous. The sharp middle-aged cop, Sergeant Phelan, according to the nameplate on his desk, exhaled, exhaled a long sigh and stared wistfully down at his thick sandwich which he had been breakfasting. He reluctantly slid the half-eaten meal aside, then ran a palm between the double row of brass buttons on his uniform, brushing away crumbs of black bread and smearing a gob of mayonnaise into the blue fabric. I held out my copy of the journal. Suspicion darkened his features. He shot a protective glance at his sandwich as if worried that my presence was a diversionary tactic so that an accomplice could snatch away his salami on pumpernickel. I looked around the small dismal room. The other living creature in the waiting area of the Trumball police station was an inert basset hound curled up in front of a smoky pot-bellied stove. From within the stove came the muffled hiss of a fire started struggling to ward off the spring morning chill. It was a losing struggle and the odor of burning soft coal did nothing to improve the room's atmosphere. Turning back to the sergeant, who had the expression of the hound and the shape of the stove, I again tried to force the newspaper on him. After a slow slip of his coffee, he took the paper and cautiously drew it close to his broad, baleful face. Squinting, Phelan scrutinized the front page like it was a gold certificate of an unfamiliar, unfamiliarary large denomination. First, the masthead and date, Tuesday, April 13th, 1920, then the major headlines. Pickford Fairbanks honeymoon delayed. Palmer blames primary loss on Detroit radicals. Railroad strike paralyzing commerce. Near the bottom, I said. Phelan appeared annoyed at the interruption. He probably wanted to linger on the story about Mary Pickford possibly being a bigamist, but he directed his eyes below the fold and began to read how I'd shot and killed a Bolshevik. After a minute, he paused to peer up at me. You're Rawlings? This too, I already told him. Yes, I said with, diminish with diminishing patience. Mickey Rawlings, I played for the Tigers. Then why aren't you with the team? Season opener's in Chicago tomorrow, ain't it? I held out my right forearm and drew back my coat sleeve to show him the bandages. Busted wrist, I explained, then said yet again, I didn't kill Emmett Seaver. Sure you did, says so, right here. He poked his chubby forefinger at the newsprint. Right here, it says it. 
For a police officer, Sergeant Phelan had a peculiar notion of what constituted evidence. I don't care what it says, it's wrong, and I want it corrected. Then go see the editor or somebody. Read the story, it's the police who are claiming I did it, that's why I'm here. Phelan grunted and calmly resumed reading. He got shot in the fraternity hall, huh? I was tempted to respond, no, he got shot in the chest. Instead, I said, yeah, fraternity hall. Oh, look here, Phelan turned the paper for me to see and pointed at the final paragraph of the article. It's being called self-defense. You're not being charged with nothing. Hell, this story makes you out like you're some kind of a hero for getting rid of that red. So what's the real problem? Would you want to be accused of killing somebody if you didn't do it? He pondered a moment. Well, I don't expect that would bother me as much as if I did kill somebody and the papers printed it. The basset hound stirred long enough to issue a loud yawn. Phelan promptly echoed the dog. Resisting an impulse to shake him alert, I said, there was a cop at the hall last night. He talked to me after it happened. Akins, his name was. Detective Akins. Is he here? Can I see him? I don't know no Akins. Phelan folded the journal and slid it back to me. You better try headquarters. Where's that? I hadn't been in Detroit long enough to know where the police headquarters was. The only reason I knew about this station was because it was across the street from the Tigers ballpark. Bates and Farmer, about a block from Cadillac Square. You can't miss it. He reached for a sandwich and lifted, to, lifted it to his mouth. Apparently, as far as Sergeant Phelan was concerned, I was now a headquarters problem and didn't warn any more of his time. Thanks. I grabbed the newspaper, tucked it under my arm, and turned to leave. Through a mouthful of food, Phelan mumbled, Still don't see what you're so worried about. What's the worst that can happen? When I stepped outside the station house, an icy breeze struck my face. It felt like I was pressing my cheek against a window pane. An eastbound Michigan Avenue streetcar approached, its bell clanging and its wheels squealing as it crawled to a stop in front of me. I was about to hop on when I changed my mind about going immediately to the police headquarters. As the trolley resumed it rattled its rattling journey downtown, I stood on the corner debating my next move. Cold began to numb my skin while a warm, breathing sensation that I couldn't quite identify started to gnaw at my insides. I looked across the street to Navin's Field, to Navin Field's main entrance, a quaint two-story structure that reminded me of a small town railroad depot. Behind the entrance, a ramp led to the right field grandstand of the ballpark proper. Raising my view slightly, I saw pennants flying proudly above the roof. In nine days, fans would be streaming into this jewel of a ballpark for the Tigers' home opener. I wished I could jump forward in time and onto the diamond and just play baseball again. Instead of heading downtown, I started up Trumbull. Exasperating as feelings and difference had been, I wanted to believe him, to believe that I could simply ignore the newspaper story and it would blow over harmlessly. On the walk home through the quiet residential streets of Detroit's Corktown neighborhood, I worked hard to convince myself that Sergeant Phelan had the right attitude. After all, how bad could it really be? I wasn't under arrest. I knew that I hadn't shot Seaver, so my conscience was clear, and the Detroit Journal would certainly have to print a retraction when it discovered the mistake. By the time I turned from Pine Street onto Grand River Avenue, my head had almost come around to Phelan's way of thinking, but my gut remained emphatically unconvinced. By now, I had been able to identify the cause of the turmoil in my belly. It was fear. Fear of what might happen if the Emmett Seaver situation didn't resolve itself as easily as I hoped. I heard my phone ringing as I started up the steps to my second story walk up over Carr's hat shop. It was still ringing when I reached the landing and continued while I groped for the door key. As I stumbled inside, my nerves jangled in resonance with their urgent clanging. And before lifting the receiver, I repeated aloud Phelan's words to me. What's the worst that can happen? That's chapter one of Hunting a Detroit Tiger by Troy Seuss. Like I said earlier, this is book four in a series of eight that follows Mickey Rawlings, a baseball player, uh, through his journeys and the mysteries that are involved around him. Uh, I stopped and, and chuckled and thought a little bit about uh, the old TV show Murder, She Wrote, and how uh, Jessica Fletcher seemed to always have uh, a body showing up when she was around and she'd have to solve that mystery. And that's kind of the same feeling I get with Mickey Rawlings as he uh, travels from city to city playing baseball and always, always someone shows up or uh, appears uh, dead and he has to uh, solve the mystery.
Um, E-copies of this book is, are, are available on Hoopla, so you can download and read them uh, via the Hoopla app. We also have audio e-copies available through Hoopla, uh, and I was pleasantly surprised to see Johnny Heller as the narrator, narrator uh, of this series. Uh, he happens to be uh, one of my favorite narrators, so I might have to uh, grab a copy and listen to uh, Johnny Heller narrate uh, one of Troy Seuss's books uh, as well, too. Um, one of the things I also liked about uh, the book is that's actually a, a photo of Navin Field in Detroit, which is the uh, stadium before the Tiger Stadium was built. So I was happy to see that it was historically accurate and they talk about Navin Field and there's actually a picture of Navin Field on there. Uh, and I wouldn't expect anything less from Troy Seuss. He is a member of the Mystery Writers of America, a member of the Society for American Baseball Research as well. So his books, I think, are, are well researched. Uh, I like the baseball uh, aspects in the books as well. It's not too overwhelming. Uh, Kirkus Review uh, has said that uh, this is Mickey Rawlings' fourth outing, and it may be his best nine innings. Uh, the New York Times Book Review called this book full of life. The USA Today said a perfect book for the rain delay, and it's an absolute winner. So again, this is Hunting a Detroit Tiger by Troy Seuss. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have.